Hello, my name is Tony. Sometimes the stars align for a movie and that movie finds itself in just the right place at the right time. It catches the mood and imagination of the public, is powered onwards and upwards by the fawning adulation of the critics, strikes gold at the box office and is a global hit. It becomes a household name and it snags a shitload of awards. The French Connection was such a film, a classic American cop thriller released in 1971 and based on a true story. Story. It was popular with audiences, praised by critics, heisted Oscars for Best Actor Gene Hackman, Best Director William Friedkin, Best Film Editing and Best Screenplay Ernest Schaff Tidyman. It ranked fourth at the US box office that year, with an international take of nearly $52 million off of a $2 million budget. That is none too shabby, amigos. Producer of The French Connection, Philip D'Antoni, had scored an earlier mega-hit with Steve McQueen's 60s groundbreaking a bullet, and so, being on something of a roll to all intents and purposes, decided to go for the hat trick. For his next movie, not only did he produce, but he also directed what some felt to be the unofficial sequel to The French Connection, The Seven Ups. The what? Yep, the seven ups. And cue the point where a lot of people metaphorically scratch their heads, feel a rush of puzzlement and wonder just what the hell I'm talking about. Because for reasons unknown to this very day, the seven ups is not a household name type of film. The drink seven up may be well known, but the movie the seven up certainly isn't. It didn't mash up the box office, wasn't lauded by critics as the second coming, didn't win any Oscars or other awards. It was very quickly overlooked, sidelined and forgotten about. It wasn't just as if it gradually ceased to exist either, more like it never existed in the first place. That quick. If there's a Twilight Zone, a parallel dimension, a purgatory that sucks up certain films randomly and without a rational selection process, then that's where the Seven Ups went. One minute it was there, the next... Lucky for me, right on my doorstep, there was an earthbound portal to that twilight zone that briefly allowed some of those films fleeting access back into the world of the 1970s before the curtain descended on the fracture in the space-time continuum and they were lost forever. Or until VHS, Laserdisc, DVD and Blu-ray became the dead media equivalent of the 19th century resurrectionists. The market hall cinema, the last bastion of hope for movies that were about to be, or already were, pronounced deceased and cast into oblivion. I caught what could very well have been the last movie theatre airing of the 7-Ups in the UK in 1974. After the market hall, there was truly nowhere else a film could go. When I would talk to others enthusiastically of it, I was met with blankness and sometimes outright concern. The blankness because they didn't know what I was referring to. The concern because the film I was describing seemed attributable to some sort of imaginary construct, a delusional psychosis, a break with reality. Didn't take me long to stop speaking of it, as I figured I didn't want to be sectioned and wind up in the booby hatch. So I just played along and shut up about it as if the Seven Ups had never existed and I'd never seen it. But, dear viewer, it did exist, and I had. First of all, that title did it no favours. What sort of title is that for a film? It sounds too similar to the fizzy, hypercalorific, cardiac arrest-inducing drink of the time. Who makes a film about a soft drink? Scratch that one from the watch list. That it actually refers to the moniker of a secret plainclothes police squad and the perps they successfully arrest, go into the big house for seven years and up, isn't immediately apparent until it's explained. And it's explained in the film. So for many, it's meaningless and without context until they watch the film. And if they don't watch the film because they were alienated by a title they couldn't understand, then the film don't get watched and they'll never get the meaning. I had no idea what the title meant. I just went to see it because it was screening that day. That's how I operated. Could have been called Day Glow Fudge Guzzlers in High Rise Tokyo gazebos and I'd have still turned up and been just about the only one there probably. Big surprise that. Roy Scheider is Buddy, who along with his three colleagues, played by Victor Arnold, Jerry Leon and Cliff Barnes from Dallas, also known as Ken Kircheval, comprise an elite New York police team known as the Seven Ups. They use unorthodox methods to run stings and takedowns on career criminals whom traditional approaches have failed to apprehend. Surveillance, undercover work, devious strategies and violent overtures are the tools of their trade. New York is a mob stronghold and Buddy works the mean streets where he grew up. His childhood friend, 
DeVito, Tony Lobianco, known as Undertaker because he works as um, an Undertaker, at least that's a pretty fucking obvious reference, has mob connections and his buddies go to snitch. Only problem is, Vito has a little side action going. He's working with two crims, Moon and Bo, Richard Lynch and Bill Hickman, in a racket to masquerade as cops and kidnap wise guys and sell them back to the mob for ransom money. Although lucrative, this is a career pathway akin to swiping honey from a ravenous killer bear, or stealing fish from the jaws of a great white shark. Future prospects and chances of advancement are limited, as is the likelihood of prolonged respiratory functioning. Despite this, Moon, who looks like a creepy scarecrow in a suit, wants to increase their activities, despite Vito urging caution. Recklessness ensues. Events take a tragic turn when an undercover Cliff Barnes is killed in a botched kidnap ransom attempt, and the Seven Ups are put on ice as a result. Buddy and his remaining colleagues are now acting on their own and out for revenge, determined to uncover what's going on and take Moon and Bo down. This is a terrific film for a whole host of reasons, and it's a crying shame that it isn't better known, more highly regarded guarded or more widely viewed. If you've never heard of it, that's not any great shock, and if you haven't heard of it, it's a fair bet you've never seen it. And here's why you should perhaps seek it out and give it the time of day. I'm going to jump straight into one of the major recommendations. D'Antoni's previous productions, Bullet and The French Connection, both played host to amazing car chases that set cinematic benchmarks for thrilling vehicular stunt work. I'm going to go out on a limb and proclaim that the car chase in The 7-Ups is better than its illustrious as predecessors. I'll even go one step further and suggest that it may be the best movie car chase ever. It is thrillingly fast, frantic, nail-biting, suspenseful, unpredictable, and an absolute rush. You know when a chase gets it right on the money by the way you can feel yourself leaning over in your seat when a hairpin turn is taken, or you have to catch your breath when an impending collision is avoided by a hair's breadth. This chase is impeccably choreographed and filmed, as Scheider in his 1973 Chevrolet Nova Coupe rockets through dense traffic in pursuit of Bill Hickman's 1973 Pontiac Granville sedan through New York's Upper West Side, across the George Washington Bridge, into New Jersey's Palisades Interstate Parkway and New York's Taconic State Parkway. Editing by Jerry Greenberg, who won an Oscar for his work on The French Connection, is some spot-on, razor-sharp dynamic shit. And if Bill Hickman's name sounds familiar to classic action movie junkies, it's because he was the stunt driver's stunt driver and worked worked on God knows how many movies. Here he's even playing the role of Bo, Moon's largely monosyllabic partner in crime. Believe me when I tell you if you want to see a pre-CGI car chase executed near flawlessly, this is the one to see. If it doesn't take your breath away, then there's some really bad news in store for you. You're dead, and they've forgotten to tell you. The Seven Ups is as gritty as hell. New York is rendered as visually unflattering, thoroughly deglamorized. Locations include derelict railway siding, stretches of graffiti scarred brickwork, barren waste ground strewn with rusting junk, and riverside shacks in a state of decay. This is not one of Woody Allen's romanticized hymns to the city. Not at all. The cast is as hard as nails, apart from Cliff Barnes, that is, but we'll let that one slide because he gets blasted with a sawn off shotgun whilst in the boot of a car, which is rather hardcore. Roy Scheider, in the days before Jaws propelled him to superstardom, plays a thinly disguised version of his French Connection character, a game based on the real-life cop Sonny Grosso. And he turns in a great tough guy act as a man whose career could have gone either way, cop or mobster. He chose to be the flip side of his duplicitous friend Vito, who took another path. His steely ruthlessness extends to breaking into a mobster's house and threatening to disfigure his wife with a broken vase unless he coughs up information, and shutting off the oxygen supply to a wounded wise guy lying seriously ill in a hospital bed. Certainly, he has little problem pushing the boundaries of the legal system. The general atmospheric is one of modern noir with an abrasive cynical edge. The climactic shootout between the Seven Ups and Moon and Bow is suitably tense, nervy, and violent. And the downbeat epilogue in which Buddy confronts Vito for his treachery is a dish served very cold indeed. Despite Vito's pleading, his kids, his sick wife, it all falls on deaf ears as Buddy resolves to throw him to the wolves, in this case his mob colleagues, and walks away. Beautiful stuff.
So you've got a magnificent world-class movie car chase, a tough-as-old-boot script by Albert Rubin and Alexander Jacobs, some great action sequences, engaging on-screen interactions, good acting, decent characterization, creepy villains, and vibrant atmosphere. Add to this some striking cinematography by Urs Führer, who did similar impactful work on the original Shaft, and a decent if generic score by Don Ellis. Plus, the overall sound design is terrific. And there it goes. Released. Sinks without a trace. Gone. Honestly, sometimes I despair. I really do. If you've never had the pleasure, I can only say this. If you have an interest in the classic crime movies of the early 70s, those macho, muscular and masculine flicks of old, then it's essential viewing. If you like movie car chases and this one has passed you by, you owe it to yourself to seek it out, treat yourself to what could be the very best on offer. Because it's very unlikely you'll get the same level of skilled stunt work, sheer physical commitment, quality and gut-wrenching realism replicated in the films of today. Real petrol heads and speed freaks will love it. Trust me on this. Other to that, once again, thank you sincerely for your time and attention. You know what to do if you want to do it or what not to do if you don't. Meanwhile, here's a song called Black Friday. It's not linked to the film in any way. It was just lying around. Bit like me. Ciao, pilgrims. They like to tell you it's a bargain And this time round it's our best sale ever Once in a lifetime narrow margin Profiteering never been more clever Service. When all you want is to get it down you Those double shots don't be nervous Not love your feeling all around you Set them up, glancing light beams off the optics Knock them back, China ducks all in a row Chopstick, Black Friday fever, guess you never know. Swing like you're winning, you could have a fall. No end and no beginning, life's a free for all. There's a limit And if you want it best act faster Hold your breath then you're in it And you can tell triumph from disaster Set em up Glancing light beams off the optics Knock em back China ducks all in a row Kick em down Breaking bone like a chopstick Black Friday fever Guess you'll never know oh, oh.